So uh, yeah, let me get started with the conceptual questions. Um, I don't, I haven't looked at this. I probably should have, but let me look now. And um, oh wow, so okay, most of the questions are from uh, either the portable TA or the uh, uh, or, or open stacks. Okay, so uh, let me <laughs> look at it and uh, um, try to. Um, tell you something about each of these questions. Um, um, so so question two from chapter 15, it asks, explain why at high frequencies a capacitor acts as an AC short, whereas an inductor acts as an open circuit? Um, the easiest way to answer questions like this would it be to appeal to impedance, uh, which your textbook covers also. Um, it, they do it in terms of phasers and reactants. That's perfectly fine. I do it in terms of complex impedance. And we've told you that um, the complex impedance of a capacitor is 1 over I omega C. And the complex impedance of an inductor is I omega L. And the important quantity here is omega, uh, angular frequency of your driving voltage or driving current. So uh, with the capacitors, omega being in the denominator means this value becomes a smaller the larger the frequencies. With the inductor, this value being numerator of imaginary fraction <laughs> means that um, it, the induct the impedance of an inductor goes up to infinity as the angular frequency goes up to infinity. So that's the simplest way to get, get at it. Um, you can also look into some um, sort of characteristic properties of capacitor and inductor, but I, I think those take more effort than uh, just using impedance. <laughs> um, uh, this is one of the reasons the circuits can be sometimes like its own discipline separate from physics, which is that once uh, you accept certain rules, um, rules like the Kirchhoff's uh, rules, and uh, rules like what the impedances of the circuit components should be, then you can do the rest of the analysis and reasoning sort of divorced from the physics context. It's uh, really its own discipline. Okay, next question. The average AC current delivered to a circuit is zero, right? However, the average power dissipated in the circuit is not zero. <laughs> Explain why this is. You know, this I uh, did a more uh, extensive lecture earlier, and uh, I think that was the point of me covering it. So let me just to make sure you know where it is, because I think it's embedded into one of the longer lectures, which isn't ideal, but lecture kind of came out long when I was doing it. I didn't have any, um, I, I don't know, other than re-recording it later, I don't have a way to fix it. So I talk about power dissipated in circuits. And I think you can do it with a part one video. Because as far as this question is concerned, you don't really need to deal with capacitors and inductors. I think in the part one video, I did some coverage with capacitors. And uh, these are auto-generated uh, um, uh, chapters, so <laughs> I wouldn't rely on that too much, but they are enough to go over. Okay, plotting, I'm pretty sure there I illustrate some of it. So yeah, so when you plot what the voltage and current looks like as a function of time, then you can see uh, why, um, why it's the case that your average current will be zero. This is a sinusoidal thing, it'll average out to zero. But once you start calculating the power, you are squaring it. So you can either calculate the power as um, I times V, or you can rewrite it in terms of uh, resistance and say power is I squared R. In both of those cases, what you have is that um, this uh, current, for example, one that used to go between positive and negative, positive and negative, it's all going to be positive because it's a square. So, um, so yeah, and, and the rest of the lecture also goes through some derivation, I think, of 
of yeah some <laughs> vulnerability. Yeah, yeah, if there some derivation of how what the analytical function for that uh, shape, uh, plot shape is, and but uh, into this uh, section of the lecture that uh, auto chaptering has labeled as plotting, that's where you will see that uh, conceptually explained. So so yeah, uh, look at that. I think that's. Uh, uh, quicker than me trying to rehash that argument. And uh, uh, question three, you know, here the, I will tell you the most uh, um, <laughs> kind of the number one thing. Uh, I, I don't know how many people realize this. Whenever I refer to portable TA, um, portable TA is like a solution manual. It's a solution manual that your teacher is telling you to use. <laughs> so let me show you what that looks like. Um, so I think there's a link to portable TA from syllabus. If not, I will find it elsewhere. So when you go to the portable TA, uh, which is linked from syllabus among other places, and it, it's that, um, it'll take some time to download. It's like 20 megabyte file, okay. It's <laughs> um, so, okay, I even gave you a question reference. It's question 44-2. So let me go to that uh, section. 44-2, uh, 44, uh, so that's like 280 some pages. Uh, so 44-2 is what I'm looking for. I'm in chapter 44. Uh, here it is. So this is the exact question. And so, you know, the way portable TA um, author and I recommend that you use, well, one of them is that you should use it. Like <laughs> It doesn't matter how good a resource is if people don't look at it. So. One, you <laughs> see, take a look at it. I gave you the question reference so that you can easily look it up. You'll see that it's the exactly the same question. And the way you should use it is you should first give yourself some time to think through the question, five, 10 minutes, however long is enough that you feel like you've spent enough time. But uh, I wouldn't recommend spending any more than like 15 minutes because after some time, you've already thought through the kind of the things that would come to you given some amount of time. So once you feel like you had a chance to think it through, maybe jot down some stuff, not to turn in, but for yourself, then the next, very next section is the answer on that question. So, so, you know, read through the answers here <laughs> and uh, uh, try to uh, refer to what you've jotted down and see how, what, uh, what you missed, what you maybe got. And, um, so, so, yeah, that's the, um, that's the number one hint I would give for this uh, conceptual-ish question from Portable TA that you have in your conceptual questions. Now, you know, don't copy and paste from Portable TA. Um, you will see in the model answers that I've titled all the Portable TA answers, which took quite a bit of time. And, you know, you don't need to do any of that. For conceptual questions, you can um, kind of summarize your understanding. That's what I would rather see than word for word copy, which doesn't show any understanding. <laughs> um, yeah. So, okay, I think the last question is something that I've written, right? Okay, so I'm referring to one of the figures from the textbook. It's illustrating resonance. Um, I think there's a, um, yeah, so <laughs> figure 15.7 in section 15.5. So let's go to uh, section 15.5. Almost there. Because I want to show the uh, circuit reference uh, because that will help clarify some other things. So figure 15.7, oh, there it is. Uh, where's the circuit reference? <laughs> okay, the RLC series the circuit of this figure, which is in a different section, section 15.3. Okay, so this is the circuit you should be thinking of as the question talks about the RLC or LRC series circuit. So you have a power supply that's trying to drive some voltage and it's connected in series with these three components. And the order doesn't actually matter. Um, you will see that in analysis using like comp complex impedance or even Kirchhoff's rules. Um, the order in which these are placed doesn't matter. Register could come first, last, doesn't matter. Co could come in the middle, <laughs> doesn't matter. <laughs> so, so, okay. Um, this is the, what they're describing as resonance. So you measure how much current flows through the circuit, and it's saying that 
it's a, a functional frequency. It depends on frequency. And there's a certain frequency where you see the most amount of current flowing through the circuit. Okay, so explain some features of this resonance by answering following questions. Okay, oh, what is special about the resonance frequency? I think I just said that, <laughs> where you have some current maximum at this frequency <laughs> that looks special. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, that's a, really one of the things you would say about resonance, that you get the most uh, effect produced with the same amount of um, effort or driving input, same amount of uh, input voltage. Why is the maximum current through the circuit of resonance given by V0 over R? Oh, this is, um, I guess, uh, um, once you become familiar with AC circuits, maybe in your electrical engineering class or upper division uh, circuits lab, <laughs> physics class, um, then the way, so, you know, for this class, it's fine if this uh, line of argument doesn't come uh, intuitively to you. Uh, but I will tell you how I would answer it with all my experiences with the circuits, uh, both AC and basic semiconductor circuits. So when I'm analyzing this, um, I have some driving power source, and I'm going to just use complex notation. <laughs> and uh, so I have uh, impedances of these elements. The register has impedance of resistance, and the capacitor has impedance of 1 over I omega C, or in this uh, case, uh, more uh, illustrative expression is where I've uh, rationalized the 1 over I. You know, with the 1 over I, you can multiply with the I over I to rationalize it. Then you get minus 1 from denominator, I from numerator, so this is minus I. So I can rewrite this as minus I over omega C. And I have uh, inductor as I omega L. And what's uh, special and notable with uh, capacitors and inductors is that their reactances have these signs. They could be negative or, well, I guess here it could be positive. And um, what that sign introduces is possibility of these two canceling each other out. So when you have resonance, that's basically what's happening. So here, because these are series circuits, as these cancel each other out, what you do get is capacitance plus inductance, or the impedance of capacitance plus impedance of inductance, uh, adding up to zero. So if these two add up to zero, then the only remaining impedance in this whole series of circuit is the resistance. That's why the maximum would be given by this as if the capacitor and inductor isn't there. Because that's really the special thing that happens on resonance, that the impedance of capacitor and impedance of inductor cancels each other out. Now, in your lab, you're going to see parallel uh, capacitor and inductor circuit. Uh, when they are adding in parallel, the impact of adding them would be a little bit different, but you will see that in lab. Yeah, I think that's all the uh, questions. Okay, so I think that covers everything. Um, I'm going to move on. <laughs>